Well, good morning, everyone. Ooh, that was kind of weak, guys. Sorry. We're going to have to wake this group up a little bit. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Andrews. All right, there it is. There we go. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and see what today's. Uh, okay, here we go. We at uh, St. Andrews here. We're inspiring our community. Fantastic. All right, today's theme verse. Will you guys all say it with me together, please? They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, and you will stand seated patiently between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Please greet one another. Everyone, today's responsive reading is going to be from Psalm 127, and it goes as follows. Um, just a real quick brief thing. I'm going to be the leader, obviously, of the people. There'll be a woman and a men's side, so please just follow accordingly, please. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Please stay standing for our next song of worship. Your name, angels will come, the earth 
in this season of uh, Lent, uh, that time between Ash Wednesday and Easter that draws us, uh, gives us a chance to kind of slow down, maybe, uh, you know, put some things aside that are often distracting us from God, and uh, kind of refocus. And a uh, big part of that emphasis is just uh, that idea of repentance, um, that idea of, you know, all those ways that we idolize the wrong things and put the wrong you know, put our lives in order the wrong way. And, uh, and so here in the season of Lent, uh, you know, we'll just be doing things a little bit different in structure and, and worship and, uh, you know, and just in the season of the church. And so let's go ahead and uh, confess our sin using these words from Romans 3. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one We have all turned away together. We have turned. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Well, the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sin. As a called servant of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for what you have done for us, and um, the mercy and the grace that you have poured out in our lives. Help us, Lord God, in this season. Um, to slow down, to refocus, to recognize um, all uh, that you have done, all that you keep doing, all that you are trying to do in us, around us, and through us. Help us, Lord God, to experience your grace anew each day, your strength and your peace, and help us, Lord God, to share your hope. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oops, I'll have to skip that tonight. Go ahead and be seated as we hear our first reading from Scripture. <clears throat> the first Scripture reading is from Malachi 3, verse 13, to chapter 4, verse 6, and it can be found on page 1021 in your pew Bible. You have spoke arrogantly against me, says the Lord, Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out the, his requirements and going about his mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possessions. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else, I will come and strike the land with total destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. 
This morning, I have something really special in this bag, and I'm going to ask you to guess. I'm going to give you only one hint as to what I have in this bag. Um, the hint is that this is the world's greatest tool. It can do hundreds of things, and it's specifically designed to do them all. All right, any guesses as to what tool I have in here? Yeah? Oh, you guys are so smart. You're right. It was my hand, right? And that's pretty amazing. You knew it too? I knew. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I should have put something else in there just to be silly. But yes, my hand, right? God gave us hands, and they do a lot of things, right? They're help, they help me hold this microphone. They help us re write. They help us draw pictures, help us build things. Our hands are pretty important, yeah? That's right, yeah. So if you've been following along as we've been reading the story, right, we've gotten to the end of the Old Testament. Are you excited? We've gotten to Nehemiah. He, remember, the people of God, the Israelites, they were carried off into exile. They've come back to Jerusalem. They built the temple. And now Nehemiah is helping them build the walls around the city of Jerusalem because the walls are important. That's how they defended themselves, right, because this was before we had... Um, all kinds of weapons, right? So they needed a big wall to keep the bad guys out, okay? And so they were all working to build that. They also used their hands in praise to God, right? Thanking him for all that he had done for them, provided for them, and how he had brought them back safely to Jerusalem and helped them to build, rebuild the city and the temple, and that got me thinking about us, too, right? We also have two hands that we can use to praise God in all that we do, right? So I hope that you'll remember that and continue to lift up your hands to God and to lead others to know him, too. Yes? Right. Well, we can still praise him, right, even if we don't have hands, right? Because we can use our voices. We can use our whole body to praise him. So, yeah, good question. All right, well, let's pray right now. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for being with us and teaching us your ways. Help us to follow you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and rise for our next song of worship.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. This can be found on 1093 in your pew Bible, beginning with verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil has finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the gospel of the Lord.
everyone. Be seated at this time. God's grace and mercy be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, I don't know if you realize this, but if you've been tracking with us, you've just come to the last chapter in the Old Testament part of the story. And, um, you know, as we see that the Israelites have come back from exile, we saw this two weeks ago, they rebuilt the temple. Now we see in this last phase, that, uh, this, you know, two other phases of returning exiles with Ezra, with Nehemiah, and they, uh, and they have rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Yet, uh, those who are there seem to think, ah, it doesn't look or it doesn't feel like, you know, the glory days of Solomon where it was written, he made silver as common as the stones in the street. It's not that simple. It's not that easy. And, um, and it seems that as they kind of then settled into life after these, you know, wonderful events, that um, it seems like maybe they argued that they'd been faithful, but there was a bit of bitterness or resentment hanging in the air. At least that's what God saw, um, who reads our hearts like we read neon signs, right? And so he sent the prophet Malachi, and he said, Hey, hey, you have spoken arrogantly against me. And they did the standard reply of just about everyone. What? What? What have I said? What have we said? What? What have we said against you? And he said, you've said it's futile to serve God. It's futile to serve God. It's vain to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements? What do we gain by going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Must be vain to serve God. So things are not what they want them to be. Uh, There's things left undone. And they're even saying in their hearts, and it even sounds like out loud too to some degree, it's vain to serve God. You know, again, what's the point of keeping his commands when things aren't going as smoothly as we want? And it's interesting, this little phrase where they said, and why why are we going around like mourners? I, I have to think that that's kind of referring to repentance. But even the question itself is somewhat flawed because it's like, well, here we're, we're faking that we're mourning and that we're repentant, and yet you still won't give us what we want. Is almost how I read that question. It's like, you know, we're kind of putting on a good face of repentance and mourning and, you know, and, and being all humble before you. But for some reason you keep seeing through that and you're not giving us what we want anyway. Which is kind of like the opposite of repentance. Right? And it isn't, you know, just the goal of repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation, reconnection with God, not just what I want. And so, you know, that, that, that's what we're seeing here today. And, and, and as, you, as you look around, I mean, you could probably say the same thing that they're saying at the time. I mean, aren't the arrogant and the proud looking blessed? I mean, aren't evildoers seeming to prosper? I mean, don't, d- doesn't it look like at times that people who are blatantly putting God to the test and, you know, living, you know, away from his word, his desires, his purpose and plans for our lives, aren't they just getting away with it? I don't see many people getting smited, you know? You know, some of our more common complaints are saying things like, I'm tired of nice guys finishing last, right? I'm tired of the jerk at the office getting ahead, you know, when the rest of us seem to struggle. I've heard, uh, you know, if your spouse cheats on you and leaves you and it looks like they've got a pretty good marriage, why do two adulterers have a pretty good marriage? Things like that. Why do pastors who don't know the gospel from a hole in their head, right, and are just kind of preaching stuff to get rich, why do their churches grow and get big and all of that? You know, I've been, you know, I've heard from businessmen. I've been faithfully following God's, God for years. It's time to make the sale. It's time to see my business, you know, you know, grow and expand and explode. I mean, we, 
I've heard these all the time. Thought a few of them myself, right? It's a similar view as expressed in the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you've ever read that book. Good book to read, although don't listen to most of it. (laughs) Because basically the primary voice is the teacher who's actually become quite jaded and bitter and said, what's the point of it all? I've tried to be good and the evil do just as well, if not better. Everything I've earned will just be given away to someone else. He's probably going to blow it. What's the point? What's the point? It's vain to serve God. Th- these, these mindsets kind of like make God like an investment account, don't you think? Right? If I put in, I should get this back. If I put this in, then this is what I deserve to earn. And I hope you realize that's probably not the best way to look at a relationship with God. But I think we've all been there and played that game to some degree. Because isn't God just good enough in himself? I mean, isn't he the reward? I mean, I appreciate some of our Presbyterian brothers and sisters or came from that background may have learned this in their little catechism years ago in the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end of man? So glorify God and enjoy him forever. Glorify God. Enjoy him forever. I like that. I agree with that. I mean, God is the reward. God is the reward. And yet, and yet, it's vain to serve God, right? You know, that's the attitude that they're struggling with. I mean, as you reflect back on the Old Testament, maybe you've kind of wondered, what is all this mess about? And we brought this, I brought this up a little bit, just did it with the Bethel teachers as we kind of ended the Old Testament in December. It's like, what is with the craziness of the Old Testament? And quite frankly, we're not the only ones to answer this question. From the days of Marcion, ooh, ooh, anyone know who that is? You know, uh, no, never name your kid Marcion? Good, because he was a heretic. Anyway, um, you know, Marcion, back in the early 2nd century, and we're now in the 21st century, so you can kind of tell it's been a while, he wanted to unhitch the Christian church from the Old Testament. Because sometimes the argument goes, or usually goes somewhere like this, the Old Testament is like, you know, just filled with so much junk. How could a good God do that, allow that? You know, that's not what a good God is. What? is going on there. And in our culture today, where it's, you know, be happy, selfish, easy, you know, what, what permeates so many of our attitudes and thoughts, I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to rub up against it. Now, I am not going to assume at this moment that I know exactly why God had the Old Testament written down, preserved, and delivered to you and me even today. I don't necessarily know his top-level answer to that question. But I do know some answers to that question. I want to share a few with you as you kind of just maybe reflect on the Old Testament as we're listening to what Malachi is trying to say to us today. You know, one, the reason for all those messes is to show that our personal sin is actually really, really bad. And I mean really, really bad. I mean, from Adam and Eve, think about this. Their are two first kids. One's dead. One's a murderer. And it hasn't gotten much better. Right? Our personal sin makes messes, destroys things all the time. Every single hero in the Old Testament has clay feet, right? Even the good people aren't all that good. And the ones who, st- who seem to get through unscathed, we just didn't know enough about them. Okay? And yet God was able to carry through all these cracked pots of sinners and saints, the living water that then poured out on the world through Jesus Christ and is still being poured out. See, the Old Testament helps us realize, oh my gosh, look at how far we fall short. But oh man, look at what God has done through his people. It also picks up on the idea of our corporate sin, you know, the sin of the group is also really really bad, right? You know, when everyone does what's right in their own eyes and the whole cu- culture is kind of acting that way, it gets ugly 
and it gets ugly fast. I mean, you know, they seem perfectly justified to enslave each other, rape each other, murder each other, destroy each other, slaughter babies, steal, abuse, lie, cheat, abandon spouses, and more. And if you hadn't noticed, we're still doing most of that today. If not all, and we're even getting better at it in some way. So it's still bad in that sense. We also see in the Old Testament, you know, this natural evil pops up. The famines, the plagues, uh, um, you know, we see storms, we see other disasters. We see in our lives today with earthquakes and tornadoes and, and tsunamis and all these other things going on. And, 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 and Scripture tells us that that's because that's a painful reminder of the consequences of our sin. A very painful reminder. Then and now of the consequences of our sin. And then the, the last part, though we see through all of that, though, is that God does set limits. Now, they're not necessarily the limits you and I want. Um, we seem to judge God with impunity about uh, what the limit should be <laughs> on sin. You know, um, in fact, I was having a conversation with a nurse in Oakland Children's Hospital yesterday. Why was I having a conversation with a nurse at Oakland Children's Hospital yesterday? Because my daughter is at Oakland Children's Hospital yesterday and still today, and I'll go see her after this. And this nurse has uh, been working in pediatrics for several years. She is a Christian. And we had a great conversation about why does God allow suffering? even in children. And she wasn't coming at this from in theory. She's lived it the last several years of her life. She's served in it. Oh, by the way, if you're, if you're complaining about a lot in life, I'd really encourage you to go volunteer at a children's hospital. That'll rework your attitude awful quick. Awfully quick. Yeah, so, so she's been in those wards that are filled with foster children and, you know, potential foster parents come in and go away, you know, because they don't want to take things on. And, you know, and, and, you know, and she's seen all this stuff. And she, you know, so we're, we're asking at this, and it's kind of like, well, you know, you know, and we had a great conversation about what is the purpose and meaning behind suffering, even suffering of children. Because I could ask the question myself. It's like, well, why did Hylon have a seizure? Well, because she has sturge Weber syndrome, and that's common in, in, in that. And so, okay, there you go. That's a technical answer. But, but why does she have sturge Weber syndrome? Well, that goes back to in the womb. And so, um, you know, so then the question is, well, is it something that she did? Does God just not like her? Does, uh, you know, did something, did her parents do something? And there seems to be no reason for that. And in fact, Jesus actually answered that question one time. John chapter 9. They see a blind man. His disciples say, hey, Jesus, blind from birth, it says. Hey, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And we still think like that in some ways, right? Sometimes. And Jesus said, uh, it was not this man who sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, in that case, Jesus actually healed the man. And so, the argument might run, well, the works of God are displayed when healing comes. But let me ask you this question. Are the works of God displayed even in the suffering? Even in the suffering, right? Right? Now, as one who loves and follows a Lord and Savior who was nicknamed the Suffering Servant, I believe that God works in both, in the healing and the suffering, and that His glory is in each. I mean, how can good come from each? suffering, even a child suffering. In my own limited view, let me just give you this answer. I know a lot of people who, because of their own suffering and struggle in childhood, became things like doctors and pastors and nurses and missionaries and social workers and foster parents and adoptive parents and teachers and coaches and lawyers and all these other vocations. So that they could serve and help. 
And I know countless others who, because of the suffering of a, a sibling or another you know, childhood friend, became vocations like that in others so that they could serve and help those in situations that they'd seen, that they'd gone through, or even just other ways as well. I mean, they often gave up pursuits that may have been more profitable, may have been easier, you know, may have, you know, required less hours to make a good living, and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, said, oh, forget the, you know, American retirement dream thing. But they brought hope and love to countless millions. Some of you in here do what you do because of something that happened when you were a child. Most of us in here probably do what we do because of things that occurred when we were children. And so even in my crazy limited view, I can see countless good coming from the struggle of a child. Countless good coming from the struggle of a child. So this kind of makes me think maybe what we're looking at and how we're often oriented towards things, uh, the struggles, the strifes, the disillusions that we create, you know, the, the blame that, that, you know, that starts to go on in our mind. It's vain to serve God. It maybe needs to be reoriented a little bit. And to what, right? To what? Well, I mean, if you listen to the prophet Micah, not Malachi, but Micah, he said, well, why don't we... Uh, why don't we work on just being just and um, loving mercy and kindness and, and walking humbly? When Jesus was asked to break it down, he said, well, I'll, he quoted the Old Testament again, like we saw here in our gospel, and he said, well, love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That, that pretty much covers it. Maybe it is love. Maybe it's also that, you know, that idea of faith. You know, these three abide, if you remember 1 Corinthians, these three things abide faith, hope, and love. Maybe it has something to do with that. Maybe not the checklists that we want to do, right? You know, to kind of keep it, things together on the outside and on the surface. Maybe that's not what it's about. Maybe you can track with this analogy. I'm, I'm not sure. I think a great disservice and all kinds of damage is done to humanity when we put all of our eggs in this 70 to 80 with all these pharmaceuticals nowadays, 85-year-old-ish, you know, basket that is our life here on this earth. You know, we put all of our eggs in this basket. Now, if you took literal eggs and put them into a literal basket that you knew would break, and then you start walking away with them, and it breaks, and all the stuff that's in it, you know, obviously falls apart, and then you whine about it, we'd say, you're an idiot. You're a fool. You knew it wouldn't last. You knew it wouldn't last. So why did you put all your eggs in that basket? Friends, your earthly life is not going to last. Why put all the eggs in that basket? Why do you think Jesus told us? Seek first my kingdom, God's kingdom, and his righteousness. Don't worry about all these things. Why do you say, you know, leave all this stuff behind, and I'll give you even more than you could ever imagine. Focus on something that's going to last. Put your treasures there, not here, where we know they won't. Where we know they won't. Because... It's not vain to serve the Lord. It's not vain to serve the Lord. That's what uh, comes in next in Malachi's words. It says, so there's the group of whiners over here. 
And then there appears to be another group that says, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. That's the NIV translation. Some argue that it could actually be translated, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and said, God does listen and hear. God does listen and hear. Either way, it's good news. I mean, either way, he does know. And he does get it. You know, the God who sent his son into the world to become the suffering servant on our behalf is a God who listens and hears and understands and loves and heals and restores and gives more and then, and then gives even more than we could ask or imagine. Not just for here and now, but forever. And so I, I really encourage you to, you know, kind of get along the lines of a, of a Mordecai of a Shadrach and a Meshach and a Benigo, and realize he is going to act. He does act. I mean, I find it interesting that uh, many people, um, it's inter- usually about the same people who complain that God lets bad things happen are, are also the same people who don't want to accept that God will one day stop bad people from doing things. And reward the ones who trusted in him. And uh, scripture says that God is going to honor both kinds of people. Those who love God and want to be with him will be with him forever. Those who wanted nothing to do with him in this life get that request honored for eternity as well. You know, and, and usually the same people are complaining about both. You know, that that is true and that there is still struggle in this life. But then, you know, because the next words of Alakai says, a scroll of remembrance was written in God's presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honors his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. There will be a day. There will be a day when it's all made good and right. And, uh, and, and, and I love, as we start next week into the New Testament, I love how Jesus has already entered in and started this, right? The blind started receiving sight. The deaf started hearing. The lepers, le- leper, le- not the sp- well, the spotted people, not the spotted animals. The lepers were cleansed. The lame began leaping. Even dead started rising from the dead and becoming alive again. God was breaking that in in Jesus Christ. And now you, you get somewhat of a choice here, right? Because you can look at the things of this life and you can get jaded and bitter and say it, it's vain to serve God. And we probably all struggled with that a little bit in our own hearts and minds. Um, You certainly have heard people say that. And, uh, you know, the same circumstance can draw someone closer to God. Another, it seems, pushes them away. So you have a choice in this matter. You can say it's vain to serve God. Or you can say God does listen and hear. God does listen and hear. God does act. That's what Mordecai said. He is going to act. He is going to act. You can say with the prophet Isaiah, he has carried our burdens. He has taken them to the cross. I mean, he promises so much more than anything this world can offer. And then you can say with an Ezra and a Nehemiah and others, let's hold on to him. Let's wait it out. Let's make this place better as we look forward to a place that is infinitely better than here. Because here's actually what I know the story is pointing us towards. Jesus. And he's the one who's making this an infinitely better place and preparing us for an eternity with him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you um, for what you've done in Jesus Christ our Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us in this um, ups and down world to just... 
to rejoice with those who rejoice, to weep with those who mourn, to accept um, and yet try to even make better the struggles and the trials when they come our way. Help us, Lord God, to, to recognize that you listen, that you are acting, that you are working, that you are good. And I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to recognize it is never vain to serve you. The promise is there. And we will experience something beyond what we can ask or imagine. To the praise and glory of your holy name. Amen. Let's rise and confess our faith together here this morning. We use these, these other ancient words of the Christian church. The Nicene, a little bit longer than the apostles, but gro grounding us in faith as well. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God, God, very God, the very God, begotten of man, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From, and he will come again in glory to judge of the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead. We have seasons in our church year, and we're entering the season of Lent. You might notice that our altar is a little bit different. Instead of having a beautiful white linen cloth over the top, we have burlap. And instead of the brass and the sparkly stuff, it's now wood. It's myrtle wood, actually. And it reminds us that God sent his son who humbled himself, who was king of kings, lord of lords. And he humbled himself to die on a cross for us, that he would do that for, to pay the price for our sins. So I just wanted to kind of remind you as you look at the altar uh, that things are just a little bit different during the next six weeks. A little bit different, but that's okay. So let us pray. Good morning, Father. We thank you for this Lenten season when we remember the sacrifice of your son who died for us. Through your grace and mercy, you provide for all of our needs. Thank you for the gift of baptism. Help us to be excited and filled with joy that you are our Father and we are your children. You give us wisdom and goodness and kindness through the righteousness of your Son, Jesus. Through him, we are able to receive his strength and to do every good work. And in our baptism, you give us your Holy Spirit to make his home in us, to purify our hearts, to control our words, and to protect us from the evil one. Help us to live a life of faith and godliness, of holiness and purity, of unity and courage, and of childlike humility. Let us love, honor, fear, and follow you, that we may live and die as your children. Lord, in your mercy, this morning, we reach out to you amidst the busyness, everyday dealings of our life. We stop at this time in our worship to reach up to you, seeking your presence, your help. Help us to remember our purpose to serve you with all of our heart. Help us to reflect your love and your forgiveness. Help us to love and serve like your son who loved and served us. Help us to build up one another, always caring, always encouraging, 
and always helping each other to become the person you created us to be. Help us to trust in your strength when we feel weak. Slow us down so we can spend more time with you during this season. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering death and persecution because of your faith, of their faith in you. Help them to feel the prayers from churches from around the world. And let them know that they are not alone. We also pray for those who are entering full-time ministry as pastors, teachers, deaconesses, and DCEs. We ask for your Holy Spirit to place them in churches where their gifts can be used to build up your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we are thankful for the way you lift us up and carry us through difficult times. You graciously give us strength when we need it, peace when we're sometimes impatient, and healing of heart and mind. Be with Ramona Barrows, be with Ilan, and be with all of our families and friends who are in need. Give to each according to their needs. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, be with our children in our church. Help them to grow in spiritual wisdom and strength and their love for you. Be with our parents and families. Continue to bless our homes and help us to feel your presence each and every day. Lord, in your mercy. And lastly, Lord, help us always to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us. Help us to remember the, the cost of your love. We pray all these prayers in the name of Jesus our Lord. And all God's people agree and say, Amen. At this time, you can be seated as Pastor Dan comes forward. Just a couple things I really would encourage you. I'd love to have you come support our people as they uh, here in the season of Lent on Wednesday evenings. We'll have worship. Uh, many of you are kind of used to coming out here already with classes and confirmation and high school youth. And uh, we're going to have um, our talented people doing drama, uh, doing dramas, often kind of monologue dramas this week. With the, they'll match the, uh, the upcoming week of the story this coming uh, Wednesday. Um, Valerie Anderson, our very own Valerie Anderson, will be Anna the prophetess of the, at the birth of Jesus. And so, again, these are... Uh, oh, and Jeff Kramer's uh, doing it for the first time this year. That's exciting. He's coming up the week after that, right? It's the next week, isn't it? Yeehaw. So, so uh, he gets to be Matthew. Uh, he gets to be the disciple Matthew. And, uh, and so uh, got a good lineup again for you. So come on out, support them after the, uh, you know, after the uh, service we'll have a time where we can talk about what's going on in the story that week and uh, just a good opportunity to kind of you know have a, a good faith conversation get to know someone kind of connect with people um, after a beautiful you know brief time of worship and uh, and devotion there so that uh, you know w wanted to really point that out to you and then the uh, um, the only other thing I, I kind of wanted to let you know is our incredible ministry that is so inspiring with how they work and love and 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 serve our 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 community with uh, disabilities um, is having their annual talent show on um, uh, Saturday, March 23rd. So uh, check that out. Uh, it's going to be, it's awesome. It's, it's a lot of fun. So that said, there's more things. Always look there. We, we send you out e-news. We send you out fish hook. We send all these things. So check those things out and, um, and respond however the Lord leads. Let's go ahead and give an offering to the Lord right now.
Let's rise. In the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks, broke and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also after supper he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it for all them to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood it's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's pray our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. let's come forward and um, receive the body and blood of our lord for the strengthening of our faith the forgiveness of our sins and join each other together um it, just a reminder, as, um, as we use these uh, different communion uh, trays, um, sometimes the, the cups stick in this one. Don't squeeze, twist, twist. Okay. God's peace to go and be seated as we begin to come forward. See you. 
Please rise. And may the body and blood of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith to eternal life. And now may the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.
have you uh, sit down just for a few moments. Wanted to give you an announcement, kind of an update, uh, sort of what's going on. Uh, you know, we're transition year, right? We've got about four people. Um, on staff who will not be on staff by the end of the summer um, and, uh, you know, retirements, moving on sort of a thing, preschool and church side of things. Um, you know, back in August is when the first meeting, I think, occurred, uh, started a transition team of people smarter than me uh, to kind of help me, you know, evaluate us, you know, go through the process. What do we need? What do we need to do? Been working alongside the council and the other staff through this whole process. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been a while. And, you know, you've heard, you've, if you've been looking in the fish hook, we've been, announced, you know, kind of putting updates there and, you know, and other uh, kind of mention it here and there. Um, you know, we tried maybe for a DCE intern, someone like Tracy, uh, an intern that did not work out. Uh, we, we've, uh, I don't think we can get a DCE grad either, so we can still call like a DCE from the field, uh, meaning uh, take them from another church where they're already working. That's what that means. But, um, but that's all good. That's the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. But anyway, um, and then we've also talked about maybe pursuing a seminarian, you know, someone coming out of seminary, so a new pastor, not necessarily a younger pastor, but because uh, a lot of them are second career nowadays, but a new pastor. And so list, la last Monday, six of us, four staff, two on council, interviewed three different seminarian graduates. And if you pray, which I hope you do, that the Lord raises up workers for the harvest, you know, because, uh, you know, the uh, harvest is plentiful, labors are few, do that. These were three good guys, and it was great. You know, hey, they'll be good pastors in the church. We need more. This is actually the smallest seminary class since the early 1970s. So it's a, it's a slim pickings this year, but two of them were like, God bless you, on to your ministry, not here. Um, you, you know, again, good folks, but not what we're looking for, not necessarily what we're needing. Um, one of them was like, hmm, he speaks Spanish. He's really got an orientation to, to reaching out, discipleship, community. Um, you know, we thought as that group of six, this is someone that we think we'd like to offer a call to. Here's how it works with a seminarian, if you don't remember. Uh, several years ago, 2010, 2010, 2010, we tried this, uh, we tried this, um, and we put in a call for a seminarian. Others did. We did not get that person. We got Holly, which was better, right? Uh, which was better. So, um, and that worked out well, and God is still working uh, with her through her here, even as she kind of felt, uh, certainly God called her to another vocation, um, you know, in our community. And, um, and so we know that we've tried this before, and it didn't work, but it did work. And so that's what we're uh, really uh, probably going to do. We're going to try, and we're going to see what happens. Um, and, um, but so... Uh, again, what is this person going to be doing? They are going to help us lean out, not just lean in. Uh, they help us kind of restructure who we are a little bit. And the staff is excited, actually, about what's our strengths, what can we do, who can do what best, and kind of move forward like that. Um, we have other people coming on, like Kirk Hamilton. I don't know if you know this gentleman right here. He's becoming a life lay deacon will be taking care of our visitation shut-in ministry. Uh, we have others being trained in that area to do other aspects of ministry around here as well. But this is a, this would kind of help restructure us and help us to lean outward. And we have a lot of connections in the district to support. And um, so, if, okay, those of you who were here long enough, 13 years ago, I showed up and I was a little raw, <laughs> you know, needed to learn a few things. You know, this would be the same of another 26-year-old young, uh, young guy trying to become, a, you know, trying to become a, a, a good pastor in the Church of God. And, and um, but I think it's a great opportunity. So we're throwing this out. Please just be in prayer in that process. Um, we are following our constitution and bylaws on this. Um, there's not even any time to like call a congregational meeting, and it's not required for any call except the senior pastor. So it doesn't have to be done by a group of the congregation, and we don't even have time for it anyway because we kind of have to let them know uh, within the week, uh, hey, we'd like to do this. And again, no guarantee. Uh, we're going to let the Holy Spirit sort that out. Um, you know, and if that doesn't go, then we'll, I, I've already got the plans to how do we shift from there. So, um, so there's that. If you have any questions, I'm just going to go over there um, at the end of this service. Um, so if you have questions, please come up. 
and I would be happy to answer any questions in this regard, because it's a big deal. I mean, you know, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, it might seem like it's quick, and it is quick, but it's also been slow, because we've been planning and, you know, praying about it for months and months, and we know it's coming, but some of these things, it's like, you know, you strike while the iron's hot, and, you know, and that's just how it goes. So I'm, I've actually, you might not believe this, I've actually stayed on top of this, you know, process, um, you, know, you know, and been pretty darn organized, you know, through this whole time. I mean, I know that might be a shock to some of you, but we've actually stayed on top, and that's just kind of the nature of the process in some ways. So, um, so that said, um, I'll let you finish, and then I'll just go stand, huh? Huh? Okay. Behold, he's coming soon. Well, you gave it to me. I'll be right over here, so if you have any questions, come on. Uh-huh.